Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a man of war, the text says. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Lord is his name. And uh, this message tonight is going to be about soldiers from start to finish. And uh, won't be a whole lot of gospel and a whole lot of scripture, but you know, uh, I think that I think every year you ought to pay some attention to the war dead. Back when I was a boy coming up, November 11th was called Armistice Day. And they, they soon found out there wasn't any armistice declared, so they called it something else. They called it Memorial Day, is that what they call it? Well, it's Veterans Day, that's a good one. And when I was a boy, it was armistice because the war was over, but they quickly found out the war was going to keep on going, so they changed. And uh, November 11th, heaven no, no, November 11th, the unknown soldier's tomb, and have this ceremony, and all the war did. And uh, there's something to it, there's something to it. And so my message is along these lines tonight. Father, bless your word. May the Holy Spirit of God bear witness to the truth and order as we preach. Now, as you sit here in this comfortable building in free America, may our minds drift back through the years and remember the terrible cost and the terrible price that's been paid, not once or twice, but time and time and time and time again. And Lord, we know that till you come, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And help us, Heavenly Father, to remember these things and abide in thee. And remember, you're not only our Savior and our Lord, but you're the captain of our salvation, the man of war. And, Father, may we not be surprised when things work out the way they do. And may we trust in me for all things and our provision and strength in the battle and the struggles of life, as well as all other places. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, my text says the Lord is a man of war. And that's a character that uh, a liberal preacher knows nothing about. Liberals preach about the lowly uh, Galilean and the lowly Nazarene and the man of Nazareth. And the hippies grow beards like him and grow hair like him and... They don't take baths like him. He, well, I know he washed in the River Jordan. <laughs> Says so over there in Matthew 3. And uh, they try to act like him and look like him, walk around, hold up the papal Vatican sign. It's been a Vatican sign for a thousand years. It says peace. It isn't peace. That never means peace. Well, never mean peace. Uh, that's, that's been the signal for an attack in the infantry ever since Nimrod. 2000 B.C., man. Nothing to do with peace and that. All that mess. And they go around, you know, this peace, this lovey-dovey, brown-haired Christ that kind of walks around with long, flowing robes and a basso provando voice looking like Khalil Gibran, the prophet, or something. And uh, the, the, the modernists know something about uh, Christ who is a man of war. And back, uh, back early, in early days of the church, they had a lot of songs about the Lord Jesus that had a military flavor to them. I remember one he used to sing in the Episcopal Church. And I guess it was as far from a military cramp, camp for training Christians you ever saw. It was more kind of like a civil rights uh, workers' union or something. But they, they, had a, they had a hymn in the hymn book there called The Son of God Goes Forth to War, His Kingly Crown to Gain, His Blood Red Banner Streams Afar, Who Follows in His Train. Did you ever sing that one? I think they've revised that recently. They're singing, if they told the truth about it, they'd sing The Son of God Goes Forth to War, His Kingly Crown to Gain, uh, His Blood Red Banner Streams Afar, We Follow in the Train. <laughs> That's about how it has to be for modern day Christians. And so we have a soft, effeminate type Christianity. You know, uh, this church here, one of the few churches in town uh, where the men outnumber the women. You go to have the church in this town, the women outnumber the men four to one. Four to one. And the many churches in this town, they outnumber them eight to one. And it's a sad commentary in Christianity. Do you know that? That's a sad commentary. It's a sad commentary when the greatest man that ever lived, that fought the greatest battle a man ever fought, and won the victory, and held up the standard, can't get anybody to rally the standard but a bunch of elderly ladies and little children. That's a sad situation, brother. And so I'm going to talk tonight about the Lord as a man of war. And first of all, I want to say this about him. He's the greatest soldier that ever lived. Now, there have been some great soldiers, but I'm going to tell you why he's the greatest in the short to and prove it. There have been some great soldiers. Sergeant York was a great soldier. Sergeant North, October 8th of 1918, he came back with 132 prisoners. I had to run kind of a turkey shoot on them for a while. And when you take 132 German prisoners, why, well, you've done a pretty good day's work. And you take Audie Murphy, who was a great soldier. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
and uh, they've been uh, art to warm up. Uh, they call him the one man army of Bataan. He go out at night patrols behind the Japanese lines. He is a tough soldier and a brave man. Bill Mullen had a fellow in his outfit called, they call him the Mad Prussian. And he was of Prussian descent. He was an American soldier, but he was of Prussian descent. And his idea of a good time was to go out behind the enemy lines at night with a poncho and grenades and a loaf of bread and a bayonet under his poncho and carry on one-man patrols, go on three and four days at a time. He'd go out behind the lines at night and slip around. He'd find two crowds sleeping. He'd cut one of the throats of the bayonet and go off and leave him there. The other fellow awake. Wake up next morning, look at him, you know. That was his idea of sport. And uh, there have been, there'd been some great soldiers. Rommel was a great soldier, no doubt about it. Rommel used to catch a British general, and so when he'd get him to tent, he'd give him a lecture on the mistakes they made. <laughs> Rommel would catch a bunch of British generals and put them in and show them a sand table and say, now you should have gone here, if you came through here, you should have gone this way. Don't let that happen again, you know. <laughs> Character. And there have been some great uh, soldiers. General Patton was a great soldier. I know they cussed him, they talk about him, and they, they try to paint him up like he was the last of the right-wing extremists. But let's just face it, that man was a good soldier. He's a good soldier. And any general take a lead tank is a good soldier. I don't care what anybody says. Any, when you find a general up in the, in the battalion area, he's a good soldier. <laughs> Let alone a lead tank. And yet you know something? The Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest soldier that ever lived. In the first place, he fought a longer battle than any of them fought. The Bible says the Lamb is though slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, we have a soldier to deal with tonight that knew all his lifetime what he'd come for. He set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem and endure the death, the spies, and the shame, and endure the shameful, horrible, terrible death of the cross, and to sat down the right hand of God. I'm talking about a soldier tonight that knew for 33 years what was going to happen to him and went ahead anyway. Now, you know something? It's one thing to step into... It's one thing to step into combat, uh, knowing there's maybe a chance of getting out, maybe a chance not, 50-50. And it's another thing to go into combat knowing you're going to be tortured to death. And the Lord Jesus Christ knew from the time he hit this earth, from the time he went to the cross, how he was going to die and never turn back, and fought that battle for 33 years. Outcast, friend of the friendless, betrayed and denied, hope for the helpless and dark grossness, a dark a grossness he died. The Lord Jesus Christ fought that battle for 33 years, never flinched, never went back, set his face steadfast to go to Jerusalem. There have been some long battles. The Battle of the Somme in Flanders Field in uh, Europe went on and on and on and on and on for months and then years, and that thing wound up with 1,500,000 casualties. 500,000 casualties in the British Army alone. And just went on day after day after day after day. There was a 30 years war fought in Europe back in the days when Europe was emerging from the uh, bondage of Rome. And that 30 years war, families fought against families, civil war for 30 years. That was a long one. But I talk tonight about a soldier who knew from the very start and knew when he was back in the bosom of the Father in eternity that someday he'd be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He fought a longer battle and that is no. He fought a stronger enemy. He fought a stronger enemy. Uh, you, uh, we have enemies to fight against. Uh, if you ever have to fight against a, a real uh, good crack uh, North Korean outfit that are made large up of red Chinese, you know you hit something. If you ever have to fight against the Turks, which you may shortly, you know you hit something. You know who the best fighters in Korea were in the armies that came in from Europe? They were the Turks. They were the Turks. You better leave that bunch alone. If you ever hit an Australian outfit, you know you hit something. Or a Scotch outfit. If you ever hit the German Wehrmacht between about 1938 and 1945, you know they don't act like they act on combat in a television show. <laughs> they don't have to shoot your head off. They'll shoot your head off. And so we've had some strong enemies to fight against. But you know something? The greatest enemy any man ever fought against was smarter than Einstein, richer than Rockefeller, wiser than Solomon, and more powerful than the international bankers, brother. And that was the devil. And the Lord fought against Lucifer and fought against the principalities and powers of darkness and won the fight. Uh, when, when men get out there in action, they act all kinds of ways. You get all kinds of bravery under all kinds of peculiar situations. And uh, people say, well, our bunch is the best and our bunch is the best. But there's a, they're, pretty, they're pretty sure ways of, of uh, gauging out the quality of troops after a while. And if you, if you wanted to get a scale of who could fight good and who couldn't, you could pretty well lay it out if you studied military history. But I'll tell you, the greatest enemy anybody ever was up against was invisible. 
And you know something? There's one soldier that Rommel never whipped, and Patton never whipped, and Von Yodel never whipped, and Von Rundstedt never whipped, and Keitel never whipped, and Kesselring never whipped, and Powerless never whipped, and Modell never whipped, and Grant never whipped, and Lee never whipped. And that was death. And that was death. But I speak tonight of a soldier who conquered hell in the grave. Greatest soldier that ever lived. No soldier like this one. And when we report, when we report about his battles, report about his death, we ought to tell the truth. We ought to report the thing right. We ought, we ought to raise him up and magnify him and tell the truth about it. The truth about it was he was by far the greatest soldier that ever lived. No soldier like him anywhere on this earth. We ought to tell the truth about it. When we report his casualty, he died and became conqueror over hell and the grave and became conqueror of death by dying, through dying. I, I, I'll never forget that memorable account in All Quiet in the Western Front where Paul Bauman has to go back and, and tell Franz's mother how he died. And he goes back there. Franz died in the hospital, legs amputated, and then died of gangrene infection in the hospital. When Paul Bauman goes back, he has to report the casualty to the mother. And in the account in All Quiet in the Western Front, he said, Who is this woman that falls before me? Who is this woman that smothers me with tears, that cries and howls and wails? And he says, who is this woman that begs me to tell her, tell her how he died, how he died? What difference does it make how he died? Thousands of them died. And Paul says, I tell her, I tell her he died easily. I said, uh, I said he died easy, he didn't suffer. And the mother says, oh, he suffered terribly, I heard him in the night. She said, when I go to bed and dream at night, I'd wake up screaming, I'd hear him cry in the night. He died terribly. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And she says to Paul, she says, don't lie to me. It'd be much better if you tell me the truth, no matter how terrible it was. And he says, he died easy, he died easy. And she says, how? So he makes up a story. And he says, I almost believe it myself. It was so good when he makes it up. He got shot instantly and died instantly. And then she says, uh, do you swear that you're, uh, if you're telling me the truth, uh, so help you God? And he says, well, might as well. I mean, those things come right with us soldiers. And he said, yeah. And she said, do you swear if you're telling the, a lie, you'll never get back from the action? He says, I swear. <laughs> he never gets back from action. And I think about that woman saying, tell me the truth, tell me the truth, tell me the truth. How did he die? I'll tell you the truth. He died for your sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried, rose again the third day from the dead, according to the scriptures. That's the truth. That's the truth. He died for you. He didn't die as a martyr. He died in your place and died in your stead. And fought the strongest that a man ever fought, and conquered and came out on top. Now, that isn't all. He won a greater victory. He won a greater victory. There have been some great soldiers and great armies in the face of this earth, but when Jesus conquered death and hell and the grave, he, he, con he made a permanent victory. Uh, the Bible tells us someday that death and hell be cast in the lake of fire. So when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he really accomplished something. And he say, and Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Uh, I don't care how great a soldier a man is or how much he thinks he is. You and I know perfect well every soldier died and died in combat didn't make the world safe for democracy and didn't die to end all wars and they keep right on having wars and they're always going to have wars. And no matter who wins the victory, it's followed by a defeat. Why, when I went over to Japan after World War II and got over there, I got up in the Daiichi building with, well, there's MacArthur there and Sigmund Rhee and that fellow from uh, the Chiang Kai-shek and that bunch and they met in the Daiichi building uh, right across from the Emperor's Palace in that moat there, downtown Tokyo. And I went up to one of those meetings one time, had to cover it for radio, J-O-A-K in Radio Tokyo. And I got up there and sat down that thing and watched those fellows. This fellow said this, and this fellow said that, and this fellow said the thing, and I watched how that thing went. And they had interpreters there, and they'd tell you what was going on. And I watched that thing, and you know, the more I sat there, the more disgusted I got. I sat there and a bunch of businessmen in there. Not just officers and soldiers, a bunch of businessmen. And a bunch of politicians. And they had the wives with them. And they served drinks. The drinks went around, they sit there and smoke and drink and laugh and talk about the condition of the coal miners and Hokkaido and all this and that. And I sat there in a deep disgust, just began to fill me from my boots right up to my jacket. And I was raising the infantry, and all my people raised the infantry. We were, listen, we were taught the greatest thing a man could do is die for his country in action. That's what we were taught. We were taught the greatest honor a man could have is to die on the battlefield. We were all taught that. You say, how silly. Well... I don't know. That's how we were raised. And I sat there and watched that thing, and I said, look at here. They're giving this back to Japan. They're giving this back to Japan. They're giving this back to Japan. And we were just taught these Japanese are this and that, and you kill them, and a good Jap is a dead Jap, and all this stuff, and then train how to stick them, how to spot the planes, how to blow them apart, 
and these old Marines hit these islands, Iwo Jima and Saipan, and anyway, talk in Okinawa, and those places, and there was American blood all over that Pacific, brother, from fighting those birds. Now they're going to give the whole thing back to them. And I sat there, and I said, I'm getting out. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. And I got out. <laughs> I've only been in four years. I was going to run the 30, and I quit at four. <laughs> I saw how that thing went, and I said, I'm not going to stay in my house there. I was kind of like this, though. Did you ever read this account of this, this uh, colored fella in the Civil War that was asked these questions? This is one of the most remarkable accounts you'll ever read of heroism in battle. Uh, I saw this colored man belong to the 9th Illinois Regiment, one of the most gallantly behaved and losing regiments at Fort Donaldson. And I said to this colored man, were you in the fight? Had you a taste of it, sir? Stood your ground, did you? No, sir, I run. Run of the first fire, did you? Yes, sir, and I would have run sooner if I knowed it was coming. <laughs> Why? That wasn't very credible to your courage. That ain't my line, sir. Cooking's my profession. <laughs> well, have you no regard for your reputation? Reputation nothing but the side of life. <laughs> Do you consider your life worth more than other people's? It's worth more to me, sir. <laughs> then you must value it very highly. Yes, I do. More than all this world, more than a million of dollars, sir, for what would that be worth to a man with the breath out of him? <laughs> yes, sir, self-preservation and the first law with me. But why should you act upon a different rule than other men? Because different men set different values on their lives. Mine ain't on the market. <laughs> <laughs> but if you lost it, you would have the satisfaction of knowing you died for your country. More satisfaction you get out of that when the power of knowing them gone. <laughs> then patriotism and honor are nothing to you? Nothing whatsoever, sir. I regard them as among divinities. <laughs> if our soldiers were like you, traitors might have broken up the United States government without resistance. Yes, sir, they would have done, it, done that. They'd done that. I wouldn't put my head on the scale against no government that ever existed, for no government could replace the loss of me. <laughs> Do you think if any of your company would have missed you if you'd been killed? Maybe not, sir. A dead white man ain't much of these soldiers, let alone a dead nigger. <laughs> but I'd miss myself, and that was the point with me. <laughs> now, you know something? That's the mood of this whole generation. That's the mood of this whole generation. But we were raised different. While we, weren't, we won World War I, and somebody said, boy, the victory's ours, it wasn't much of a victory. You had World War II. We won World War II, and somebody said, boy, the victory is ours. It wasn't much of a victory. We went right into Korea. Somebody said, well, we held them at a stalemate in Korea. It wasn't much of a victory. We went right into Vietnam. Somebody said, we're going to pull their arm yeah, and then you get in the next one. You know, these are all temporary victories. But I talk tonight about a great soldier who was so great that when he got in the battle, he stayed in it till it was over, and he won it. And when he got down off the cross, he said, it is finished. And he won the victory. All right, that isn't all about this, uh, I want to say about this soldier. I want to give some reasons why some of you people sitting here tonight have never enlisted in his army. Of some of you sitting here tonight, maybe you're saved, but you've never really enlisted in the Lord's army. You're not in for the fight. You're not in for the duration. And maybe, you have, maybe you're not even saved. Maybe you don't even know him as your Savior. Now, why is that so? Well, in the first place, uh, in the first place, maybe you never fought the good fight. When Paul got through with his life, you know what he said? He said, I fought a good fight. I've kept uh, the faith. I've finished my course. Maybe I'm talking to somebody here tonight, and you're uh, saved, but you've never really enlisted, because you, maybe you never tried to fight the good fight. Getting saved and fighting the good fight are two different things. And the thousands of people that are saved, millions of people that are saved. But when it comes to look for the soldiers that are fighting the fight, that's something else. And maybe you never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ because you don't know what the issues are. You don't know what the battle is. Why, the average person out in the world, you know what they think? They think the battle is just uh, food and clothing. They think the battle is just paying the bills and raising the family. That isn't the battle. Have you ever tried to do right? Have you ever tried to do right 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Haven't you found it rather difficult? I mean, have you got any scars on you? I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Did you ever get in that fight? Man, that's a fight! Boy, you ought to see that one go. Folks, they just think it's, you know, the communists, because I think it's the 
something else out here. Why, listen, for when Paul said, I fought the good fight, he's talking about the fight against sin, man. Did you ever try to do right 24 hours a day? Pray like you should? Read the Bible like you should? Witness like you should? Keep a dirty thought out of your mind? Watch your tongue if you don't exaggerate? Tell the truth 24 hours a day? Pay your bills, not lose your temper? Not worry? You ever get one of those fights? Man, that's a pitch battle, brother. That's a pitch battle. Audie Murphy don't know nothing about that. That thing will go. And the reason why some of you haven't enlisted is because you don't know what that fight is. Uh, Audie Murphy's medal, you know what it said? It said, above and beyond the call of duty. That's what a congressional medal says, and a silver star, above and beyond the call of duty. There are a lot of people just do the duty. You pay your bills, you ought to pay your bills. You support your family and take care of your family, you ought to support your family and take care of your family. What else do you do? Do you ever do anything above and beyond the call of duty? Some folks, some Christians tithe, some of them don't even tithe. Do you give above and beyond? Above and beyond the call of duty. That's the fight. You say, well, brother, up and I just can't. I know you can't. That's what I'm talking about. That's why you need to enlist. You need to get a commander. You need to get somebody that fought the fight and can do it. Now, you know what your trouble is? You underestimate the enemy. You think it's easy to do good. You know why you think it's easy to do right and do good? Because you're not doing right and doing good. You ain't making it. You ain't making it. Anytime you think it's easy, you haven't tried. I mean, I'm not talking about just one day. I mean, try it day after day after day after day after day and put a chalk mark on the wall every time you flip. Try that fight, brother. Try that fight. If you think it's easy, you never tried it. You never got in it. You get in it, boy, it'll go. And everything will go to pieces and the devil will tempt you in ways you're never aware of before and you're, you'll be trying almost beyond endurance, brother. If you really make up your mind to mean business for God and live for God and do what God wants you to do, you'll get it put to you day and night like you never dreamed before. Bob Jones Sr. said something I'll never forget and he said a lot of things I'll never forget and I wrote a lot of them down. He said, boys, he said, if you go out of here and stand for God and stand for that book, he said, you're going to get in a battle and make all the bloody battlefields of this world seem like playgrounds. And I believed him when he said it. I didn't grasp it, but I, it had the ring of truth about it, you know. That thing just had a ring about it, and I said to myself, that thing's so. That thing's so. Our trouble is we underestimate the enemy. And that's why we don't list. We, we think the battle is just food and clothing and bills, and there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it than that. Now, when you underestimate the enemy, you always get in the mess. Uh, that's one of the first rules of warfare. Don't ever underestimate the enemy. That's one of the first rules in karate, one of the first rules in boxing. Don't ever underestimate him. Don't ever say to the fellow, well, he's, he looks kind of small. A little old shrimp couldn't hurt a flea, you know. What, wow, man? <laughs> Wake up in the hospital about three days later. <laughs> you don't underestimate the enemy. At Chancellorville, in the battle there between Hooker and Jackson in May of uh, 1863, uh, Hooker thought he had him boxed up there and had him taken care of and old... Uh, Jackson was hooked around to his rear along the side road there, and they captured a bunch of prisoners, Georgia boys, and they said to those Georgia boys, said, well, you're going to be up at Yankee land now for the duration. And one of those old Georgia boys, a plug in the back of his mouth, said, yeah. He said, you'll think a different too. Old Stonewall hits your rear. Went on around back, and they thought he was kidding, thought he was just bragging. And Stonewall was going around the rear. And they said, oh, you know how prisoners talk. He's just bragging, you know. He wasn't bragging. He's telling the truth. But he knew they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and if you wait till old Stonewall comes through, and Stonewall around the back came through those woods about four in the afternoon, and boy, you talk about hell on wheels, that was it. And I mean, there's many a mother's son that never got home that battle. Underestimated the enemy. Uh, you, don't realize, you don't realize what the fight is, really is, till you get in it. In the fight of Antietam in uh, the Civil War in September of 1862, they had a terrible battle out there in a the cornfield, and a uh, uh, boys lying over there dead and wounded and screaming and hollering all hours of day and night. And that terrible battle, Burnside Bridge had a fight across it that got so bloody that that uh, creek that ran down through there was just red with blood. And out in that field after the battle that day, there were dead boys lying out there unburied for days and wounded boys lying out there with no attention given to them, singing hymns under the stars at night while they died. And there was a chaplain out there in that field that was dying. And that chaplain knew he'd never get off the field. He heard a man about 10 yards off saying, Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Some fella wound in a bad place. And that chaplain said to himself, Well, I can't walk 
but I can roll over to him and that chap would roll over in his own blood and roll across those dead bodies and roll over where that fellow was and put his side up against that fellow's side and put body against body and wound against wound and aching heart against aching heart and help that fellow die, help his pain and died with him. And I know a soldier brother that came down here and put his wound against my wound and put his body against my body and died with me, brother. And he's the greatest soldier that ever lived, nothing like him. You know what happened to the Battle of Antietam? On that battlefield, one uh, southern boy got his eyes put out with a burst of shell, both eyes clean out, never saw again, again the rest of his life. And lying on that battlefield, just blind as about him, that screaming, hollering, cursing, shooting around him, and after about four hours, things died out, and he was pretty well gone. He heard a man next to him groaning and hollering and praying, and he turned over and said, what's the matter there, Yank? And it was a caliber of guy's accent, he was a Yank. <laughs> And he said, what's the matter there, Yank? And the Yank said, oh, my God. He said, my, my legs are broken. I can't walk. I can't walk. And the Southern said, well, can you see? And the Yank, said, yeah, I can see. And the Southern said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll make a deal with you if you are. <laughs> you know. <laughs> he said, hey, if you are, the Yank, he said, I'll make a deal with you. He said, I can see. He said, you can see. I can walk. He said, I'll pick you up. And you tell me where to go, and I'll carry you there. And they got off the battlefield that way. Yeah, I got to one crippled guy got up and hung around and said, go right, go left, look out for the stump, look out for the creek, go around the river, and took him on through. There have been some brave soldiers in this, on the battlefield. There have been some fierce enemies and vicious enemies, and you don't ever underestimate that enemy. Now listen, the Bible said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't underestimate the enemy. And so that's why some of you haven't enlisted. You don't think the battle's really there. You don't think, oh, well, he's just talking like preachers talk, you know. And you think, oh, well, that Bible, that's a good book if you live up to it. You don't, you don't see the issue. And you know, if you ever saw the issue, it'd make the hair rise at the back of your head. You don't want to underestimate the enemy. All right. Now, the next thing I want to say about this uh, business is this. Some of you haven't enlisted in the Army and haven't... Uh, come under his command, because if the truth were known, you think you're a better soldier. You say, Brother Ruffman, I don't think that. I don't think I'm better than Jesus Christ now. You falsely accuse me. Well, let me ask you this. If you don't think you're a better soldier than Jesus Christ, but how is it that you still go by your preconceived plans and your prearranged plans? How is it you still go by your tradition? And how is it you still try to do it yourself and go by intuition and instinct and feeling and everything in the world and no trust him to do it for you? You know, if I had a commander that I had confidence in, I'd have confidence in him to make my decisions. And the surest proof in this world that you don't trust him is the fact that you go right on doing it your own way. And that shows you haven't really enlisted. You act, you act on instinct. Uh, that's the way soldiers act sometimes, just on, just on their own instinct. You have to. I think about that uh, terrible account in All Quiet in the Western Front again where uh, Paul is bombers in this shell hole. And, you know, Eric Marie uh, Lamarque wrote that book, and uh, it's written as a novel. But, you know, he breathed every, every minute of it. You can tell by how it's written. And that old boy is in that shell hole, and he's, he's saying uh, when the attack comes, if a man falls on top of this shell hole and falls on top of me, what do I do? And then he says to himself, if he falls here on top of me, I've got to kill him before he kills me. And that old boy lies down in the mud in the bottom of that shell hole, about a foot of mud, puts his head under the muddy water, puts the helmet on the back of his head, you can be wise, the devil himself would come to take care of your own neck. He puts his head down there, he says, I think I'm a corpse, and run over me. And then he says, what if some guy falls in the hole with me? Reaches back and pulls out that sheep knife and holds that sheep knife under his stomach in that mud. He got his face stuck down that mud, that helmet over his head. Anybody go over the top of that thing, think he's a corpse. So you got to use his head, man. You're going to come out alive. And pretty soon that attack runs back over that shell hole and flip, flap, something slips and crash, in comes the body. And do you think... And do you think old Paul go, goes to a commander to find out what to do? Man, when that body comes in there, he just comes out that knife and I like about four times the throat for him, but he could even move. He don't know who it's coming in there. Might have been a German. They wouldn't know any difference. And slap that thing. And he describes how he had to live in the shell hole with that thing for about a day and a night. And he said he backed off from that fellow, and he said it was a Frenchman. And he said he backed off from him there and watched him, and he said, my, it takes a man a long time to die. And the fellow, he'd, he'd gurgle all day long and look at him. 
and pretty soon his eyes just got glassy and fixed, and he knew he was dead, never answered him. And then Paul began to talk to him and say, uh, I, friend, I wouldn't have done it if I'd, we'd met some other circumstances, why we'd have schnapps. I, I never had a chance to know you. It's the war. It's the get running off his head. And he said, if we'd met some other way, we'd have been good friends. It's this terrible war. Yeah, I promise you, I'll make things up to you. I'll, well, after the war, I'll go to your family. I'll, I'll support your wife. I'll, I'll pay for your children. I'll, I'll do anything. And then he runs over and tears open that Frenchman's jacket and pulls out a little old wallet there, and in that's a picture of a wife there and four or five children. And then it says, Andre Duval, printer. He closed that thing back up and gets across objects from that dead man again, begins to look at him. And he says, uh, by the evening, he said, I'm, my mind is settled, I'm a little bit clearer, a little bit more calm. He says, I say, uh, Andre, I say, I promise you when I get back, I'll tell your wife, I'll write her a letter about it tonight. And he goes on talking about corpse until it gets dark, and boy, as soon as the sun goes down, all of a sudden he forgets that body and everything and slaps on that helmet, looks up over the top of that parapet, spots the flares, spots the tracers, and gets out just quick as he can go. Instinct, brother, instinct, instinct, self-preservation. You know something? That's why somebody here I'm talking to tonight has never received Christ and never will. You trust your instincts. You trust your decisions. You're about to turn them over to any commander. All right, now why is a soldier unknown? At this time of year, we talk about the unknown soldier, and they celebrate it up at Arlington National Cemetery, and have this gun squad come out and fire the salute uh, to the unknown soldier. Uh, it's absolutely necessary to have a ceremony for unknown soldiers. I, I'm for that. I mean, I'm pretty disgusted and pretty disappointed in the government, pretty disgusted and pretty disappointed in just about everything connected with the military. My attitude uh, these days toward the military is probably not much better than a hippie, is the truth or known. And yet still, and yet still, i got enough patriotism in me to know that's a good thing. It's a good thing to remind people that people get shot and bleed and die. That's a good thing. Now, I know to some of you, it, you get tired of hearing about it, kind of irritates you, makes you nervous, you like to think about the beautiful things and the pretty things, but uh, it's good to be reminded of that. You know, for some people on this earth, life hadn't been beautiful. And for some people on this earth, life hadn't been pretty. For some people, I'm talking to some men right now in this building. And people think you're kind of odd sometimes the way you act and can't understand you. And I know why some of you act the way you do. Your life hadn't been pretty. It hadn't been beautiful. It's been hell, boy. It's been hell. And every now and then, you know, our nation just ought to be reminded of that. And I don't know what they're fighting for. Now, I confess to you, I don't know what they're fighting for in Vietnam. If you put me on the... If I had to place my hand in the Bible and swear by God to tell the truth, the whole truth, number the truth, I couldn't hear what they're fighting about over there. I couldn't tell you in a million years. So they're fighting communism. I don't believe that anymore than you do. <laughs> You want to fight communism? Go down to Cuba and save the save the uh, the steamer fare. I mean, fight it shorter, man. Fire from the shore instead of going over there. You want to fight communism? Fight the Supreme Court. <laughs> fight one of them. You're going to fight communism. You're going to fight communism. Shut down Life and Look magazine. If you want to fight it, I don't see any sense in going over there and getting your head blown off. And if I was put right in the night and said, "What are we doing over there?" I don't know what we're doing over there. But I know one thing. Back in World War II, back in World War II, we knew what we were doing. And we know what we were going for, whether it was right or wrong, we at least knew what we were doing. And in World War I, right or wrong, at least they had a cause. They the, the, the went over there, they had something to fight for, knew why they were fighting. I didn't say they were right, but they knew, they knew what they were fighting for. I can't imagine anything more disorderly than getting to battle and have to fight where you don't know what the issues are. I can't imagine anything worse. You know, when our GIs in the Third Army came through southern Germany and Bavaria and saw those concentration camps, then some of them knew what they were fighting for. They began to get clear to them then. Now, of course, they didn't fix it. It's an incomplete victory, but they knew, they knew why they were fighting. And so we ought to remember unknown soldiers and give some kind of a due to them. And yet, uh, you, I, I imagine some of you that are sitting here today don't even, uh, you never even stop to think about why they call them unknown. Why do they call them unknown? We talk about the unknown soldier. Why is a soldier unknown? All right? Number one. For many, many years when soldiers fought, they had no record of them. Now, I know how it goes in America today. They've got everything but your uh, fingerprints, and they probably got them somewhere. And they got your credit rating, and your bank account, and the hairs on your head are numbered by the federal government. But you know, it hadn't always been that way. 
and the hundreds of thousands of boys and hundreds of thousands of soldiers that died through the centuries, there was any, never any record left of them at all. Why, I'm talking about things uh, close up when I talk about the Civil War and World War I and World War II. And uh, suppose I start talking tonight about the Crusades. You say, well, who cares about the Crusades? Well, you didn't know any of those fellows. They didn't keep a record. They're, they were mother's sons and, and women's husbands and mother's boys that climbed up the, the ladders in the siege of Acre and Jerusalem and Constantinople and Damascus. They had those ladders pitched off and they fell and knighted the 200 pounds of armor and smashed on the ground with flame and fire, pulled open from the ramparts and roasted to death in the ground. Like your boy. Like your boy. Hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, throat, mouth, but who cares? No record. Did you ever stop to think about all the millions of men who died on, in the battles of Genghis Khan? When Genghis Khan would come to an area, he'd come through there and, uh, first of all, he'd kill everybody. Then he'd go in the town, tear down the town. Then he'd uh, plow the ground. Then he'd salt the ground. Then he'd burn the wood. Then he'd drag the timbers off and put them in a river, the stones and rocks he couldn't burn. He'd drag them off and put them in a the river, and then he'd go away. And when he'd go away, he'd come back about two weeks later with a small cavalry group, a patrol, and kill everybody that had been in hiding that came out. Why, in China, they estimate, they think sometimes, there was as many as 15 million people killed in the, in, the, in the attacks of Genghis Khan around 1288. But who knows who they were? Just people? Just people? No record. A soldier is unknown because there's no record of his death. The only record we have, the death of Jesus Christ, uh, of his time, is that recorded in the Bible. And there are people that today in America that don't take Christ as Savior and don't trust him as a Savior because as far as they're concerned, there's no record. They read the record in the magazines and newspapers. When they read the gospel accounts of the death of Christ, they think it's a myth. They think it's a religion. They think it's something somebody thought, uh, thought of. And just ever start thinking about this? There are millions of people overseas. Millions of people overseas who never even heard of the death of Christ. And their, their religious animals and the animals of their high priests and their sorcerers and their magicians have no record of the death of the Son of God. So that Jesus Christ to them is what we call the unknown soldier. The unknown soldier. That is isn't all. A soldier is unknown because he died on a foreign field. Uh, there are some of you tonight that have, don't have too much interest in wars. And the reason why you have no interest in war is you've never lost a, a son. You never lost a brother. You never lost a father in a war. In Germany, there's a generation that's ever grown up in Germany where a family has been hit by a war. Not one generation. They had the Franco Prussian War back in 1880. They had the World War I in 1914. They had World War II coming through in 1938. And the Russians coming in there later. Every one of them knows something about death and disease and destruction and famine and bombs, and shot, and shell. Christians in America are soft. They're not, they're not blooded, I believe is the infantry expression. And someday, we, we may, someday we're going to have to get a blood. We're going to have to get a bloody. The division's going to have to taste some fire in America to get it. They died in the foreign field. If I were to stand here tonight and talk to you, and I'm not going to talk to you much more, but if I were to stand here tonight and talk to you about the death of the soldiers in Stalingrad, it'd mean nothing to you at all. And the reason why is you're not even near Stalingrad. Young people say, well, I got other problems. Why talk to me about stuff that doesn't make any difference? See? They don't want to hear. They want to shut their ears. They don't, want to, they don't want to learn history. They don't want to learn what happened. They want to forget the lessons of history and go on and make the same mistakes again and then profess they didn't know. But when I, when I think of all the hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of German boys that died in Stalingrad in 40 and 50 below with vermin eating bodies and Lice all over those bodies, diphtheria, typhoid, typhus raging through those troops, lying down there in the cellars with wounds open that bled and festered for days at a time before they died. Makes me stand back and all, and I said to myself, Lord, if you've seen all that, and uh, we're no better than men, if you've seen all that and your eyes have beheld all that, I wonder what's going to happen to us before this thing gets through. And his eyes saw all that. Hundreds of thousands of them. But who cares? They died in the foreign field. You've never been to Moscow. You've never been to Stalingrad. If I talked about the airport there at Gumrak, it wouldn't mean anything to you. 
You couldn't see the wounded going on those planes at 40 below zero, fighting to get on the plane. I have to throw out everything out of the plane but the door to get him on board. And finally threw out the door, and the last guy jammed him there and a belt tied across his back to keep him from falling out. When the airplane went across the runway, they're stepping over the bodies of the wounded lie on the runway. And some crazy fool yells, tanks, and there's a panic. And they crush the body of the wounded lion on the runway. But you never know them. You don't know who they are. And what difference does it make? You go back to your bed tonight and get a good night's sleep. And so on November 11th, why, we have a little ceremony. And we're supposed to remember the unknown soldier. Why is a soldier unknown? He died in the foreign field. I speak tonight of a soldier who died in the foreign field. I speak of a soldier who died in Jerusalem outside of the gate on Calvary out there north of the town. And the reason why it means nothing to somebody here tonight, many people in Pensacola, is it's a foreign field. I mean, uh, what do you care about Jerusalem? It's over the other side of the globe. You live in Pensacola. You've got your problems now, don't you? What do you care about problems back then? The soldier's unknown because he died in the foreign field. That is no. The soldier's unknown many times because he's blown to pieces. He's blown to pieces. Now, in ancient warfare, it didn't happen too much, although it happened occasionally in a pile of rocks crushing down. They never found a man's body or anything. But in modern warfare, it's quite common uh, to go along there and just pick up dog tags, and you never do find who wore them. In modern warfare, an 88 hits a man, or 105, or a 155, or a, a bazooka, or a 75-millimeter cannon, you can't pick up enough pieces to find out who he was. If you don't find his dog tag, he's unknown. And there's been, there's been many a war in America that got that note from overseas, and it said, missing in action, missing in action. There were, there were mothers in World War One that when they got that, they lost their minds. And there are women probably still alive somewhere in sanitariums in this country, walking up down the hallways and saying, missing in action, missing in action, missing in action, missing in action, missing in action. There are probably some still alive somewhere, I don't know. They were when I was coming up. Missing in action, missing in action. Blown all to pieces. I believe Lance Corporal Wingate of the Queen's Royal Regiment at the Battle of the Rights Ball in 1944 had it down pretty good. He said the only way to get out of the infantry is through a grave or a stretcher. <laughs> and he said once you get in there, there's only two ways out. You die, you go back to the hospital. And uh, when Wingfield was caught one time between two artillery barrages, what we call counter-artillery barrage, where one barrage starts and another barrage counters it. And when that thing counters it and you're caught out in the middle wounded, all you do is just lie there and pray. Uh, we feel lying down here, one artillery barrage was coming out 100 yards ahead of him, one coming out 100 yards behind him. And they were wounded all over that field at night. And the sun went down, the tanks went back. You wouldn't catch a tanker out there in the field in the dark for loving the money. And the tankers all went back, and the wounded infantry lay out there at night. And those barrages closed in there and began to blow things all to smithereens. And Wingate said he'd been shot through the hips with a tracer bullet, cauterized the wounds so they didn't get infected. Burned it clear through. And he couldn't, he could just pull himself around by his arms. And he said, with that ground shaking and heaving and rocking and rolling, sometimes he'd be thrown three feet in the air and then turn clear over and hit the ground. No way to control it. I mean, the whole ground just in convulsions. And he said he lay there, he said he confessed every sin he'd done and several he hadn't done. <laughs> and he said, I was praying, Lord, get me back. Lord, get me back. I'll do this and I'll do that. And he said, I knew I wouldn't when I got out, but it sure seemed good at the time. <laughs> and he said, I was saying, Lord, I'll do this and Lord, I'll do that. And he said one time there in the law in the artillery bombardment, he said he saw four wounded men crawl together in kind of a huddle and got a cigarette lit between them. And he said he saw that bar of that cigarette in the dark, a little glow going around each man to man. He said, boy, about 15 seconds later, there was that orange flash, and that smell of that, that old sour stink smell of that exploding shell, and there wasn't a thing left there. Not a thing, just empty. And he said about a foot from his face, a little old cigarette butt sitting over there in the dark. And uh, the moral of that is, if you're within five miles of a German 88, don't light a cigarette at night. <laughs> and that thing came in, and that thing went off. There were about four men in a huddle around there like that. And to this day, you couldn't possibly tell who those fellows were. You couldn't possibly. You couldn't even find the dog tags. They're blown to pieces. And listen, I'm talking about one here tonight that people don't know because the Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the cast of our peace was upon him, with his stripes were healed, and my text in places says he was marred, his visage was marred more than the sons of men. My text says when they got through with the brutalities described on him in the Bible that he has a garment dyed with blood, brother. When he comes back to the aid station, he reports him there and says, wounded in action, brother. 
And he's the only man that ever came back to the aid station to give a transfusion instead of taking one. You need his blood, not yours. Oh, and he's an unknown soldier because a lot of people don't know him because he was marred and wounded and bruised. And last, I want to say this. He's an unknown soldier because he's an enemy. The Bible said the friendship of this world is enmity with God. The Bible says the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Uh, do you know why many soldiers are unknown? Because they're enemy. What do you care about the Japs that got shot at Iwo Jima? What do you care about? What do you care about the Germans that got shot in, uh, in D-Day at Normandy Beach? You don't care anything about them. Why should you? They're your enemy, right? And so I talked tonight about somebody who came down and died on the cross to sin, was buried and rose again the third day from the dead, according to the scripture. And he's able to say to, uh, to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him, see you'll ever live to make intercession for them. And the reason why the world doesn't have this man is because, frankly, the world consi considers him to be an enemy. You say, oh, Brother Ruckman now, no, you just haven't been doing personal work. You say, oh, Brother Ruckman now, no, you just haven't been doing what you should have been doing. And if you even knew what you knew you should have been doing, you'd know how the world feels about him. See? Never you get this soft culture of feminine Christianity that thinks everything's just fine, you've got a bunch of Christians not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This world got no use for him. You think it does, go out there where the world lives and mix with them. And see how to see what you used to have for him. And they consider him to be an enemy, and who cares about the death of an enemy? You know, after World War I, the Russians, they just picked up where the Germans left off. And there are in the Siberian prison camps today the rotting corpses and the walking ghosts of, of German prisoners of war that are in concentration camps, every bit as bad as Treblinka, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and the rest of them. But who cares? Who cares? Why, why people, we've gotten so hard to these kind of things that there are people in America that don't even care enough about our own boys to get them out of prison camp. We, we've got, I don't even know what the figures are, but we got, we got, uh, uh, scores and scores of GIs taken captive in Korea and Vietnam that never got out and never got back. Have they still got those two fellows in Russia, those two officers in Russia, those generals? They still got them? That's a good example. What they caught here about a couple of weeks ago, the United States says, we protest, we protest, we protest. The Russians said, <laughs> that's right. Russia said, oh, 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 isn't that funny? You can't get them back. You can't. Well, listen, if we don't care enough to get our own kids back, do you think we care about an enemy? We don't care anything about an enemy. Uh, people don't take Christ for Savior, he's unknown to them because as far as they're concerned, he's an enemy. Come to give them a hard time. They don't understand that he's come to give them life. They might have it more abundantly. So the last thing I want to say about the unknown soldier is he's unknown because he's an enemy. At Pont du Hoc, that was a high cliff on the Normandy Beach coast, Back in June of 1944, a bunch of rangers were sent in there, and they were sent in there to take that point and capture a gun on top of it, which later turned out not to be there. And those rangers came in there, went up that cliff, and fired rockets up that cliff to get uh, uh, grappling hooks in the top of it and climb up. They got ladders up that cliff and go up, and the Germans had cut them. They get halfway up, and the Germans pitch grenades down on top of them, blowing the pieces all over the beach. And that thing went on and on when they finally got up on top of that uh, place up there in Point Del Hoc. There was no gun up there. And the thing hadn't been worth all the lives suffered and, and uh, gone for it. But there were dead Americans all over that beach where they'd try to get that uh, cliff. And there were dead Germans on top of it. You ought to read the German account sometime. I read a German account one time of D-Day in Normandy, and he didn't read really like the American account at all. And when the Americans came in there, they were talking about uh, their pillboxes were all knocked out before they got in. Their machine gunners were killed. Their artillery pieces were knocked out of action. They had nothing to work with. One German boy said he got uh, locked up in a pillbox there, and somebody said the tanks were behind us. And the tanks came in and put a flamethrower in that pillbox and shot the thing through the flu where they breathe. And the flu is made like a disease, so the flame can't get through it. But of course, it heats it up. And pretty much the temperature down there got to be about 105 and 106 and 110 and 120 and 140. And so there were prisoners, there were Germans in there that fainted, and they were out of ammunition, and they were throwing the guns down and crying, let's surrender, let's surrender. And there was one SS captain on a slip there in that pillbox still firing down the beach with a machine gun, and they're swinging that thing back and forth, and the fellows behind him were crying, yelling, hollering, saying, surrender, let's quit, let's quit. 
And he kept on going and gave some lieutenant order back there and said, tell those people to shut up and keep on fighting. And uh, uh, our ammunition began to take the guns apart, pull out the boats, throw them all around the place so they wouldn't get accused of resistance when the Americans came in. And he said, our SS captain fought and fought and fought by himself there through that thing till the men behind him were strangling and 20 of them had to breathe together to inhale. And the lieutenant was shouting, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, 150 degrees, 160 and the sweat just pouring off them. And that thought would go on and on and on and on. And the Americans finally got in there and took that bunch captive. And of course, the SS man got killed. And this one German boy was taken prisoner. They said they, he said they took it and cut his belt. So you have to hold up your pants. That's where the way to see your hands don't reach for a weapon. You have to hold up your pants. So they cut his belt. And he's going down the beach to the prisoners holding up his pants. And he made the mistake when some limey went by and said, uh, we'll see you in Germany. He made the mistake of saying, we'll see you in England. <laughs> and he didn't mean, we're going to attack England and meet you there. He meant, I'm going as a prisoner to England. But it came out the wrong way, and the lineman got mad and smacked him down with a rifle butt there in the sand. And then he got up and went on. And you say, well, what boy was that? What was his name? Well, I don't know his name. You say, well, who was he? I don't know who he was. And you know, a soldier is unknown because he's enemy. And if he's enemy, they don't care anything about him. Uh, I draw you a picture of a bunch of first aid men in a tent, and they're tending to the wounded and giving them blood plasma and doing the best they can. About that time, they hear somebody come in from outside that's walking wounded, what they call walking wounded. And they look up there, and here's a ghastly figure that has stripes, been whipped to the bone. He has a hole in his side. He's dripping blood. He has holes in his feet. There's a path of blood behind him as far as you can see where he's coming off the battlefield. And somebody said, who goes there? Well, my text says, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord of hosts his name. The Son of God goes forth the war, his kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar, who follows in his strength. All right, brother, come and lead us in now. Uh, let's sing, uh, onward Christian soldiers marching out to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. I'm going to ask these young folks, if you would, to slip aside now and let our deacons and elders come forward and have a seat here in the front row while we sing. What number, brother? 198. 198. Let's stand and sing 198. Onward, Christian soldiers. 